Hi. I'm just going to assume everything's going smooth. <laughs> we'll see, unless someone tells me otherwise. So let's, oh, no, I can't do it. Last time was such a disaster, you all. I totally like screwed up the intro because my audio is jacked. I'm just going to do a really quick check on my phone to see if the live stream is actually live, if my audio is working. Oh, bear with me for just a minute. just a minute. Oh, look, there I am. <laughs> Meta. It's like one of those books where it's a book at the book of the book. Anyway. Okay. There we go. All right. We're good. Hooray. I think that's the first time, um, in like forever. I don't know. Okay. So a few things today we are talking about markets, fairs, and festivals in our creative businesses. My heater did just totally kick on. So hold on just a second. I'm going to see if I can do some sweet stuff with Apple home kit and just like turn it off. That's weird. It is off. I don't know why the fan just kicked on whatever. Sorry for white noise in the background if it's there. Anyway, so today we are talking about markets, fairs, and festivals in our creative businesses. Hello. Welcome to craft leftovers live. I'm Kristen M. Roach. I'm an author, artist, entrepreneur, uh, creator of Craft Leftovers, founder of Little Woods Herbal, and author of Mend It Better. Uh, each month I go live and I share all I know about a different creative business topic. This month, I just returned, like literally like 1 or 2 a.m. Sunday night, I returned from the MDW Fair, like it's a independent artist-run fair gathering assembly uh, that happened in Chicago. And like the timing was just perfect because it really refreshed in my mind all of the good, the bad, and the less than ideal about, I would just say in general, selling-based events. Um, the selling-based event scene, I guess. So don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, leave a review, all that good jazz to help continue this craft leftovers creative business project I'm doing. Join the craft leftovers mailing list to get transcripts, patterns, updates, and you know, direct to your inbox. And I think that's all my housekeeping stuff. So back to markets. There's a lot I could say about markets. I've done a lot of selling based events over the last two decades. I did my very first one when I think I was like 17. Uh, it was an art fair in a park. I worked so hard and my dear sweet dad like bought me a picnic tent cause we couldn't quite afford the like, you know, sweet, easy up pop tents. Um, and it was such a pain to set up and he, they helped me like mat and print all this stuff. And I had done all these drawings. I was in framing. For me at the time, it was a huge investment, you know? So was it, I was 17. And he even drives me there, buys me breakfast at McDonald's. I, we show up, the heavens open, and there is like, torrential downpour thunderstorm. This particular event did not have a rain date. It didn't matter anyway, because I had to work the next weekend. And <laughs> I was just like, uh, it's aside from a universe. I should never, ever do an outdoor event again. It's not true. It's just what happens with outdoor events. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like that was my very first introduction to being a participant in an art fair since that time. Well, and even before that time, before that time, I had regularly been attending craft and art festivals and fairs, pretty broad range from like local church craft fairs to like, 
uh, in the Quad Cities, there's an event called River Sans, which is kind of like an artisan art festival music. It's it's a really cool event for Quad Cities. Like it's it's kind of I mean it was always my favorite art event to go to. Um, and I grew up going to that and just thinking like that. That was like the pinnacle of my art career aspirations was to get accepted into the River Sans, because I saw those artists and they were they were making a living from their art. And I just, I saw that as like the most amazing, it was just the most ama amazing thing. I mean, to make a living off the thing that you create, you know, that's pretty freaking special. Not everybody gets to do that. So that was kind of like <laughs> my pre, pre 20 year old craft fair, art fair experience. Then in my 20s, while getting my BFA in oil painting, textile art, art history, etc., cetera, um, I had the opportunity to do a lot of really cool events, um, zine festivals, like the Chicago Zine Festival, or the Chicago Zine Fest. Um, I did, let's, oh gosh, I can't even remember, What a Load of Craft, Renegade Craft Fair, Bizarre Bizarre, uh, the Maker Fest, both as a presenter, like a keynote speaker presenter, um, having like a workshop booth, plus also the, uh, like in the Bizarre Bizarre within the Maker Fair, just all kinds of stuff. Um, when I was a curator, I helped coordinate, I was like a supporting role to coordinating the local kind of like it's the octagon art festival here in Ames. And so it's kind of like our equivalent of like say river Sans. And so like from a curatorial, uh, assistant coordinator position, I got to like help and kind of see behind the scenes of that style of event, where it's a much larger scale, several city blocks, et cetera. Um, yeah. And then like, I don't know, since then I've just done all kinds of stuff, like everything from like artist run, to, you know, in like abandoned spaces or vacant spaces to outdoor and the park, um, down, you know, I've helped coordinate zine fest now, the Roach Motel zine fest <laughs> that happened at the Des Moines Social Club. That was super fun with my, a couple of my friends and, you know, it's just, and then for Little Woods, oh my gosh, we ran the freaking gauntlet. I think we did every single farmer's market with a 100 mile radius. We're in Iowa. There are a lot of farmer's markets. So within a 100 mile radius of Ames, we did pretty much freaking every market <laughs> that we could. And it was wild. We also did like a market day, which is like more of a indie art craft day. The like, instead of like, um, Black Friday, it's like Black Market Friday. Really cool event by Cat Rocket Ship, Danny Awesome, and a couple other folks. And um, so we got to participate in that. I also participated in that as like a artist selling my zines and other things like that. Um, I've sp I've been a food vendor like with tea, as well as just selling like prepackaged products, as well as selling art. I've really ran the gauntlet. Um, I've also done a lot of like exhibits, both as a curator and as a fine artist from kind of like self-made, like I said, in vacant spaces to like being at a gallery in a more, you know, from commercial galleries to more like nonprofit or academic university galleries. Anyway, main point, a lot of what I would say selling based events, things existing in person where there's a, a one, like a limited time event that is happening. You're showing up with your stuff. It's not where your stuff permanently is. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like it's very different than e-commerce or brick and mortar. It's its own thing. Anyway, so there's kind of, there's so much you can talk about it. Like we could talk a lot about booth setup, for instance, 
but we're not going to talk about that today, except for to say, pack light, make sure your book looks booth looks plentiful, make sure everything is labeled with a price. OMG, I'm terrible at that. And also, make sure your stuff's all labeled with your name because people will get your stuff home and they won't know who they bought it from. I have this gorgeous, this pendant, for instance. I love this. I have no idea who the artist was. I got it in Iowa City. It's my favorite pendant. If I knew who it was, I would buy more jewelry from them, but I can't figure it out. Anyway, so like always label your stuff with your name, how to find you in the future. So the three things that I'm going to cover, because I really want, my thought when I started this was like, what is holding you back from doing your first market and how can I help you decide if you want to do one or not? Like that's my primary, that's my metric for success today. <laughs> it's like, should you even do a market? Like why, like why, you know, why do one? Should you do one? Is it the thing for you? Is it the best way to spend your time, money, and efforts? Um, and I wrote down the list of like, what are the three things I really want to make sure to cover? And I wrote, you know, picking the right scene, running the numbers, metrics for success. But then as soon as I started writing out my notes about like, I'm like, you know what? Number one, picking the right scene, scratch that. We need to start with like metrics for success. So like before we talk about like who who you're selling to, what you're selling to, where you're, you know, where you're going. Like, let's talk about why. And because people love, <laughs> okay, I love lists where it's like all the same letter at the front, you know. Uh, we're going to talk about revenue, reach, and research. Those are like, for me, the three main reasons why I will do a market. To make money, let's be real. To reach a new audience I couldn't tap into otherwise, or like build connections, networking for my business, etc., and to do research. So I feel like revenue is pretty obvious. You're there to show up and make money. And that kind of booth setup, the intensity, like your style and approach, and even the events that you pursue are going to be different than if you're looking for reach. They're also going to be a little different if you're looking for research. So when I say reach, I mean either in the sense of like, okay, so we did, what was that event called? I think it was Vintage Made down in Des Moines or Clive or somewhere like that. It was a huge outdoor event. It could have been so amazing. It rained a lot and there was mud everywhere. And it was a freaking mess. My friend Andrea went with me and my other shop employee, Melissa, who's also now my friend. <laughs> I don't know how they're still my friends after this weekend. They were troopers and they slogged through the mud and carried gallons of tea and like all kinds of stuff. It was messy and we made the best of that situation. The thing is, is like, if it wouldn't have rained out, we would have made a lot of money. We didn't rain out, or it did get rained and mudded out, whatever. We broke even. But the main thing that I would say was really successful from that event is every single person that we interacted with seems like they remembered us because it was not a high traffic event. But like, uh, because of the weather conditions, but we still get people who come in like three or four years later who like, oh yeah, I got your tea at this event. And most of those people, they would not be looking in Ames for a tea shop. And so like for us, it was a great impactful event that had like long reaching ramifications as far as our like reach and exposure locally. So that's what, so that's one way to talk about reach. The other way to talk about reach is like the MDW or Midway Fair, the independent art gathering. I forgot what the word that they used. Um, basically, it's an artist run event where you kind of showcase the projects you're working on and you hang out, you meet each other. That's very different in that like, I'm not really looking for like local exposure to customers. For me personally, I was helping my friend with her project. I was like in it, I was her sidekick. Um, and so for me, it wasn't even about my like own specific project. It was, I wanted to meet people. 
I wanted to make meaningful connections to other artists in the area, potential collaborators, potential, you know, gallery cooperatives, etc. or just get to know people. It's been a while since I've been in the Chicago area. It's like been since like 2000. I want to say the last time I was there was maybe 2012 for, so it's been a decade. Everything's new and different. Um, and so like for me, I really just wanted to go there and reconnect to that scene to kind of like put my toe in, see what's going on, meet some folks, say hi, as cheesy as it is, exchange business cards. Like that was actually the big thing. Like that was metrics of success for me is like, did I get over my like social anxiety and kind of my feelings of quite frankly, inadequacy or just like out of my depth or just like no one wants to talk to me. Uh, get over that. Just suck it up and be like, hey, I'm Kristen Roach. I'm an artist from Iowa. You know, come say hello online when you get a chance. I know you're really busy today, blah, blah, blah. If there's somebody who like it makes sense to have that kind of connection with, like I'm not going to just hand them out to everybody, but it was like, okay, am I willing to like get rid of like 30 or 40 of these cards to people who, who seem like their work is in alignment? with my own, you know, that could be a potential collaborator, friend. I mean, there's some people where I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to be your friend. You're so neat. Like our conversation was so good. Like I want to have more conversations with you. Like it was, it was really fun. So anyway, so that's, that's reach, right? And then there's research. So the other way to, you know, you go and you do an event, and you can learn a lot about the viability of your product. You can have, um, you can do experiments. Um, and so like, for instance, Little Woods, we started out online. I was selling my blends, all my friends. <laughs> yes, especially Andrea. Don't worry. I remember, I will always remember her being like, you just need to get these in front of people. Uh, which that's not how she sounds at all. It was way nicer than that. Although she was definitely maybe giving me a pretty hard time about it, which is good. It's what I needed. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, they were just like, these are really good. You need to get them in front of people. I'm like, they're not selling online. No one wants my tea blends. They're like, no good. You know, all, I, you're just saying you like them cause you're my friends. It's not true, but it really took, it, it did take getting them in front of people so folks could taste them smell them. I think especially if you have a product that's very tactile, that's very sensory based, like a food product or maybe like a plushie or yarn, I feel like is another really great one where it's like someone picks it up and they fall in love or they smell it or they taste it. Online, there can be a lot of barriers to purchasing simply because they don't know what it's really going to be like when they get it home. And especially with tea and spices, is it going to taste good or is it just going to languish in their pantry? So I was encouraged heavily to do the local farmer's market. And for me, more than making revenue, although that was a really nice bonus that was very affirming, um, it wasn't uncommon with that first year we did the farmer's market to sell out of our, uh, to sell out, which is awesome. But it also, by the end of it, I was very affirmed that there was a local tea market that could support a tea store opening. And so that winter is when we found our location and signed a lease on our building that we're currently in. So like you can do market research, you can do product development, you can put out fun little experiments just to see how they do. If you don't have a physical space, that's a lot harder to do online because you have to like generate this listing and all this other kind of stuff where if you're doing a physical marketing, you can just slap a tag on it and set it out. And, and that's fine. Um, I know that doesn't sound very like <laughs> fancy slap a tag on it, <laughs> but it, it, it's true. That's more like craft, indie food market, etc. In the art scene sphere, what I've found really wonderful about markets or projects like specifically the MDW project, our fair in 
in Chicago that just happened, one of the things that I noticed is that it gave artists an opportunity because it was like, oh, assembly, that was the word. It's really an event geared towards artists more to than towards the public um, in general. Like it was publicly geared towards artists if that makes sense. And then all the people having booths were artists or artists run space or like small independent galleries who were representing um, kind of up and coming emerging artists. Anyway, so it became a really great place to test the waters, to get feedback and to get work out there that you maybe Maybe you didn't quite have enough to fill an entire gallery. Maybe you had an idea for kind of an experimental installation project or something interactive, um, or you had a smaller collection of work or a collection of work from a group of artists that you're kind of figuring out how that relationship works. And, or you just wanted to showcase something that you really loved and wanted to get out into the world. The thing I found is it wasn't exactly a selling event. It was more really networking and experimentation and research in the sense of like getting feedback about your project and seeing how the public is going to respond to it as well as how the your peers are responding to it and if there's valuable feedback that can be had there. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like why are you doing it? Are you trying to find... Um, the right niche? Are you experimenting with a new product base? Are you wanting to generate revenue? Uh, are you trying to reach a new audience and expand your overall reach in person? Those are all great reasons to do a market. Now we're going to talk about the scary thing of running the numbers. <laughs> uh, this is something that I've not been good about when I first started doing markets and now I'm extremely excessively diligent about because it has really bit me the um the vintage made uh fest festival handmade market whatever was it vintage made i feel like that was its name i'm gonna have to look this up i'll put it in the show notes it's still going on it's a really great event i think they have since moved it indoors um so we broke even, even though we made, we made more money at that market than we have ever made at any other market. And we just barely broke even. And I think that's if I didn't factor in Jason and I's labor, which that's not a good way to go. You should factor that in. So some things you should think about, and I really highly recommend a spreadsheet. I might even like in the show notes share a Google spreadsheet of like one of my budgets for a market because they're like for little ones, they're ridiculous. Um, so there's fees and commissions. So like fees are at the front end. So that could be your application fee, your booth fee. And then commission is at the back end. So some markets, so like I looked into doing a, like a tea booth at the Iowa state fair and you have an initial fee, but then at the end of each day, you have to total up your receipts and then Iowa State Fair gets a commission on your sales. So make sure to factor those into your final like profitability, like potential profitability of an event. Is that like, okay, so say you do sell $5,000 worth of stuff, how much of that final evaluation commission is gonna be coming off the top of there? Then there's also labor for the event. So I made the mistake when I first was doing markets for Little Woods, I just factored in my paid labor. So like someone coming and helping me in the booth. Um, and I really should have been factoring in all the time it took me to prepare and create the product that went into the booth as well as marketing that I was doing outside of the event and um, prep time, Jason's labor, there's also babysitting, um, travel time, mileage. And then on the other flip side, anytime you do a market and you also have an e-commerce store, you have to put your shop into vacation mode. 
So there's inventory management time of unlisting product and then listing it back in or putting your shop in vacation mode and then putting it back out of vacation mode, which depending on your situation can be more or less complicated. Uh, sometimes it can be like a five minute thing for other people. It might be several hours. So make sure to factor in that labor as well as an associated cost for every time you do an event. There's also the cost of goods, kind of like that commission number. So say you sell $5,000, how much of that is actually material cost going into your thing? So like I make a thing and it costs me $10 to make it like in materials and packaging and whatever. And then I'm selling it for 20. So hooray, I made $10,000. That's actually, I don't know if that's, that. maybe that was the vintage made fair, but that, that would be a lot for me to make $10,000 in a single event. Um, well, if my materials were 50% of that retail price, that means my profit that I'm taking all that well, not even my profit, it's like my my net profit or gross profit, whatever it is, is actually only $5,000. And then from that $5,000 pie, I'm slicing away fees, commissions, market associated labor, et cetera, meals, travel. So the other things to consider in your costs is, um, I just had this, what was it? Does it, other, does it impact your other opportunities? So like, for instance, because we were doing all these markets at Littlewoods, it prevented me from doing classes. Because we were doing all these markets at Littlewoods, it prevented me from expanding our online store or creating an e-course. Um, and then, like I said, it, it, or does it just mean like your e-commerce store needs to go in vacation mode? I know... One of my neighbors, I think she has some help now, so she doesn't have to necessarily do this or she's, she herself has backed away from doing markets. But um, my neighbor across the street on Main Street, she, like us, started in markets as a core part of her business. And so she would actually close her store, her like physical brick and mortar store, to go do markets. Because at that time in her career, like in her shop trajectory or shop journey, uh, doing a market was actually more profitable for her than the sales from walk-in traffic on say like a, a Saturday or Sunday. I think that's maybe changed. Um, I don't know. Her store is really cool. I like it. It's okay. Oak Lane Candle Co. and We the Dreamers. Just throwing that out there. They, I think they have online stores. You should go check them out. Anyway, so the other thing to really factor into is your expected sales. Because if you make it, that doesn't mean they'll come. Like, it doesn't mean you'll sell it. So one time I remember, it's really this finesse of like, you want to prepare enough product or art, prints, zines, etc. to have your booth or table, whatever, gallery feel full and bountiful. <laughs> but you have to understand you're only going to sell a certain percentage depending on the venue. And so making sure that your venue aligns with what you got going on is really important. Um, and I think that's kind of the main thing. Okay. So scene, this is tricky. There are a lot of craft fairs and a lot of art fairs and festivals and markets and they really run the gauntlet. In general, I would say if you are making your own product from your own designs to put out into the world, it's been my experience, so I don't want to say this is the rule or this is the right answer for your business but I have found that if if I go to a market where there are people selling 
MLM, like multi-level marketing products. So think like your, oh, I mean, heck, I used to sell Avon, right? So we'll start there. So like Avon, Tastefully Simple, Mary Kay, uh, there's a whole spectrum of like wellness brands, supplements, lotions, body products, self-care stuff. I, I mean, cleaning, I think cleaning supplies is like a big one now. Um, essential oils, there's quite a few MLM essential oil companies now. It's just best to steer clear of those. One, it's a different kind of like the clientele may or may not mash up. So if the clientele matches up, great. But the thing that I found that really hurt me is when someone is buying a good for resale, I can never compare on price. I'm always going to look ridiculously expensive relative to whatever they have going on. Because like, you know, so for instance, our teas, like I'm never going to say Littlewood's tea blends should be cost competitive with tea that's sold in the grocery store. It's just a whole different thing. It's not that tea in the grocery store is bad or that we're, you know, well, I think we're better, but that's because I'm super biased because it's my company and my tea. But it's not that it's like one is better than the other as far as like from what you should have in your life in your pantry. You know, like so from like the consumer side, I'm not saying no one should buy things or no one that should sell them. That's not what I'm saying. Like I said, I used to sell Avon. It's, it was an important stage in my life and it really taught me a lot of skills and I got a lot of really valuable experience. Um, and you know, and then it was time to move on from that. But I've just found that if we show up to an event, well, I'd say Andrea would agree with this. Anytime we showed up to an event <laughs> And there was a lot of like direct sales and MLM kind of vendors happening. We didn't do well. And we didn't do well on any three of those points of revenue, reach, or research. Like we just didn't. And so for me, we just, that would actually be a question we would ask is like, what are the rules for your vendors? Do you allow like wholesale goods, do you allow MLM, L MLM businesses? And if they said yes, we'd be like, okay, this isn't the right fit for us. It's not that it's not the right fit for anybody or, you know, it's just for us in our business, it, it wasn't. Um, okay. Craft versus art events. There's a large There, there's like a, so I'm going to say like almost like indie craft fairs, like handmade markets, I think is what I would call them now more than an indie craft fair. So like handmade market versus an art festival. The, the distinguishing feature that I find is an indie craft market or sorry, a, a handmade market tends to be a younger demographic um, and the art festival tends to be a slightly older demographic and the kinds of things that they're looking to purchase are a little different. So like And I'm sure this is very different depending on your region <laughs> and the specific market. So like no rules here. So what I have found is like, so say Bizarre Bizarre, Renegade Craft Fair, What a Little Craft, Black Market Friday, um, Lucky Star Market, Vintage Made. Uh, everything tends to be a little slightly lower price point 
Um, it tends to be a little bit more, uh, I would say like trendy and, you know, you might have like a craft beer tent, you might have, um, I'm going to really play into some stereotypes, but it's like legit some stuff I've seen. Like you might have like axe throwing or something like that. It's more there. And it tends to be a bit more of like an experience and entertainment. Um, and then I found that like at art festivals and I'm not talking blue chip or like gallery based art festivals. I'm talking about like independent artists coming up, having a booth, selling prints, originals, etc. Those tend to be a little bit more traditional art in the sense of like ceramics, painting, illustration, jewelry, some sculpture, but more if it is sculpture, it usually tends to be like outdoor sculpture um, or like smaller pieces. There's not going to be like installation work. There's usually going to be a lot of a range of price points like prints to originals kind of ranging from like ten dollars to ten thousand dollars at an at a handmade market like say renegade it seemed like stuff kind of stayed around that like 10 to like maybe a hundred dollar price point um and people were looking for gifts a lot of times and i found that like at art festivals people are looking more for maybe some gifts, but usually they're looking more for themselves, for like their home. That's not always true. That's just been my experience. Um, farmer's market versus all of the above. So I've been seeing a lot of farmer's markets where crafters, artisans, makers, are selling and alongside vegetables. I find the the ones that I'm seeing where their booths are always busy and they're selling out are things that are consumable, like candle, soap, um, foods, like tea. Tea did great at the farmer's market. Um, spice blend, blend places, things that you can use alongside your produce, gift based things, um, kid based things, and what I would say ho like home decor type things. So like utilitarian ceramic arts and utilitarian woodworking, less than art object to put on display. Uh, that's like more like the farmer's market scene. And then kind of the last scene there is, is like blue chip gallery art stuff, think like Art Basel, et cetera. Like, oh gosh, what's the big one in Italy? I'm totally spacing on it, whatever. Uh, Basically, these, you know, like Sotheby's is showing up. And you don't get to sign up as an artist. You have a gallery representing you. And then they are kind of creating a mini gallery. And then your work is included as part of their, like, artist of, or their stable of artists. Um Full disclosure, <laughs> I've been to these. I've never been a participating artist because gallery representation is just not something I've pursued. Um, for me, it doesn't really fit my lifestyle and my business plan that I am I'm just not pursuing it. It's just not what I want to do. Um, I don't like people telling me what I should be making. <laughs> I 
I get really annoyed by it. I don't like people telling me where I should be showing my work. Having gallery representation, there's a lot of positives and I've seen some of my friends go through that. There's some pretty serious drawbacks and negatives. Um, and, and I've heard that these events are a real mixed bag for the artist. I couldn't speak to for the gallery. And, but primarily it seems like a way to find a collector base. Like you're looking for some serious collectors. And those, the, the price tags on the artwork way, way outside of my experience base. Okay, like just full disclosure, it's like, it's not my scene, so I'm just, it's really cool to go to them and to see all the amazing art. And that tends to be more installation, larger scale sculptures, like you're gonna put a big object on a pedestal, on display, in your corporate setting, in your office, in your big sweet business, whatever. Um, you know, sometimes cities will go and kind of check out artists to potentially approach them for doing like a public works project. So that is like quite a lot of like networking as well as making a lot of money, but that's like a whole different art, art scene. Um, and like I said, I've heard from friends who are in or on the fringes of, it's a mixed blessing, you know? So, and then there's artist run events and this would be more like the Midway or even like what a load of craft. So one of the things that I found is both a positive and a bit of a less than ideal about artist run events is that the coordinators are potentially almost always also participating, which means you may not get the same level of support from them during the event or like right before the event starts because they're trying to also execute their own project, et cetera, for themselves. But the really cool thing about these events is often there's a lot of freedom there's a lot of like latitude, just like to, to jump in and to help coordinate the event, um, to support the coordinators by volunteering to like kind of, so there's a bit of like, you can shape the event to be what you need or want it to be because the coordinators are a lot more open to that than say other events like say Renegade Craft Fair where they have it dialed and it's very large scale. You're a participant, boom, done, et cetera. There's like no wiggle room for participation in the coordination by the participating artists. Um, so there's, again, pros and cons to that too. So you kind of have to think about who shows up to these events if possible always go to the event first, like always. Uh, if it's not possible, that's fine. Do as much research as you can, you know, either by contacting the coordinators, looking at if there's any like recap posts by other artists or makers, uh, you know, like has anybody done a review of it from a participant standpoint? And, you know, try to find something where People are selling things that are complementary to, but not necessarily overlapping with the work that you're producing. So like for me, all my artwork is about ecology and things. I would wanna find an event where I knew people who were thinking in an environmentally conscious way would be part of the core demographic of the people showing up, but I wouldn't necessarily want to do an event where it's 100% eco art and they're all doing paintings of birds and they're all talking about migration. I mean, that could actually be like a really cool symposium and like a peer meeting group. It wouldn't necessarily be a great selling group because 
I wouldn't necessarily stand out because everybody's work is so along the same theme. Um, you know, I've done events where we were the only tea uh, blender. I'd say that's true for probably the first couple of years. And then after a few years of doing it, we actually then started having um, other tea blenders in Iowa. And there was a bit of, I would say difficulty, uh, a lack of curatorial oversight by the coordinators where our booths were actually like right across from each other. And it was so weird because they were like staring us down the entire time. Like we'd be like helping customers, whatever. And we kind of like glance up a little bit and they would just be standing there scowling at us because our, we had slightly better booth placement than us. And like our, the way our setup was and we had samples, they didn't, you know, stuff like that. And so like, uh, it, it was a little bit of a stressor. <laughs> Quite frank, we had another time where another vendor who was selling tea came and kind of like blocked our booth. It, it, it was strange. So there, you know, and then also we kind of, honestly, we stopped doing a lot of local markets because I felt like as much as it was a benefit to us and our company when we were starting out to do markets, um, us continuing to be there meant that like we have our brick and mortar now it's like us continuing to do markets meant other startup indie tea spice blenders weren't getting a chance and so we kind of s stepped aside so other people could have a chance to like be a part of that like startup in that way because more tea drinkers the better is my feeling. Um, and so that's kind of it too, is like, is it continuing to serve your business and you know, who's getting excluded because you're there. And like, so like if it's not really serving your business anymore and other people are now not being able to participate because you've been historically the person who's been accepted. Uh, so you've got like a longest at, you know, you've got an established re relationship with a market organization organizer it might be good for you to like do it every other year or if it's a farmer's market you know like once a summer instead of every single month or every weekend depending on like what your business needs is and so like that's something we've been looking at for little woods where we used to do the market like every single weekend and then we we've taken a couple years off and we're thinking about doing it again but i think it's something where we would maybe just do it like once a month during June, July, August, or something like that, or July, August, September. Excuse me. Okay. Um, let's see. Any other thoughts? I guess, you know. Oh, yeah. So I asked Jason right before I started this. This is, we got like 10 minutes left. So I'm going to tell you a little story you're going to find maybe funny. Okay. So <laughs> right before uh, I was starting the live stream, Right before I was starting the live stream, uh, Jason and I had lunch and, oh yeah, that's, uh, ah, always wrong hand. This is my dog, Bob. That's his chair. <laughs> he comes and hangs out in my studio with me and he kind of like stands next to the chair and then like looks at me with these super sad eyes. And I'm like, yeah, 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 get up there, get up there. And he like curls up and falls asleep. He's like 10 or 11 now. Anyway, so I'm like, you know, Jason, what are your thoughts? what are your thoughts on markets? I'm like, you've seen me do markets for the last 20 years uh, of all different types. You've seen me help coordinate them. You've, we've gone to a lot of them with me um, as a family, as just a couple. And what do you, what do you think about it? And <laughs> his response is, and granted, he's usually my unpaid labor. <laughs> I hate to admit it. Uh, not anymore, but that used to be the case. And he's like, I don't know how anybody makes any money at all at markets of any type 
anywhere. He's like, it is such a freaking slog. You've got to like prepare all this stuff. You've got to pack it up in your car. You have to go there, set it up. Then you got to stand there for the entire day. And it's hot and uncomfortable or cold and raining. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I should never ask you to help me with the market again. I'm sorry. <laughs> But he does have a point is that there is, it's pretty intense and then you've got to tear it all down. And then sometimes you are so exhausted from the thing that like you are out of commission for the next day or two. Um, and if you're driving to the thing, that adds a lot of cost too, because then there's the extra like travel mileage, hours of like just getting from here to there and uh, lack of support, et cetera. And then the travel back and meals and, and whatnot. So it is hard. So doing the numbers is really important. Trying to find a market who's both the scene, so like the other vendors, the coordinators, the city, as well as the people coming to the event are going to be supportive and in alignment with your, like they're going to love your stuff. Like that's, that's what you want. You want to find a market where people show up and they're like, OMG, you're amazing. Yes, I want your stuff. <laughs> like, that's it. Whether you're an artist, crafter, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like, that is the thing you're looking for. And when you find events where that's the case, that's great. Um, and yeah, what are, your, what are your goals? You know, what do you need to get out of it to feel like it was worth your time and effort? And because I still have six minutes, oh, man. We're just like, this is bonus, bonus content. Uh, so the other really good thing to think about is you, your personality, because your friend, your peers might be saying, oh my gosh, I went to this market. It was so great. I made so much money. It was amazing. I was there the whole day and I talked to all these people and it was wonderful and I feel so excited and I'm, they are an extrovert like legit do it for some people doing a market is the most exciting passion filling enjoyable love fest and they come home and they are thrilled and excited and revved up and it actually is like this is what having a handmade business is all about and that is like the experience that they are after in their creative business. Like by having a creative business, that is their joy moment, right? So for them, yeah, do it. That's not me. I'm an introvert. I see markets as really valuable, but I know there's gonna be a price to pay. So for instance, like when I got home from Chicago, I went to work the next day and I was so worn out and we were slow because there's construction in front of the shop. I was like, Hey y'all, is it okay if I just like, if I just pack it in for the day, it was like two o'clock. I'm like, I just like go home. <laughs> They're like, yeah, get out of here. You're useless. And it's cause I had spent three days being like very supportive, positive, engaging, trying to communicate with all these people I didn't know, which I'm comfortable with, but it's, it's like, it's really depleting for me. <laughs> so the way that I restored myself as I came home from work and I sat in my backyard in the sun and was just like, silence. <laughs> and now I feel great. <laughs> and... So I think that's the thing to t really take into consideration is like, what is your preferred communication style? What is that balance between what's good for your business and what's good for you? And that's a choice you get to make as a creative entrepreneur. Like you don't have to do markets to be successful. There's a lot of ways to be successful as a creative based business, like a handmade, 
I guess, yeah, just like as a creative based business. So like you are creating something and then that's what you are selling, right? So like maybe you are creating a painting, but maybe you're creating an e-course. So like there are different, there's a lot of different pathways to make that profitable. So markets is one of those ways and it can be a really useful thing um, for revenue building, for reaching new audiences, new potential partners, collaborators, supporters, etc., And for doing research about like via pro- product viability, market, you know, blah, 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 etc. You get the idea. So are you going to do a market? Have you done a market? What was your experience? Like, am, is what I'm saying like, resonating or is it just like uh that was not my experience at all like this is totally different than what i had happen um you know how did you make your market successful when you did one or like what questions do you still have about doing markets where you're like this feels really big and impossible to me because i know before i did my first market like either that first art market in the park that got rained out or my very first farmer's market where I was doing tea or my very first art exhibit, you know, my very first zine fest, they all felt so intimidating and big and kind of scary. And then I got there and I did it and it was fine. It was totally fine. It was great. Exhausting, but worth it, you know, like, and that's the thing you got to figure out is like, is it, is the effort worth it? Is the money worth it? Um, is the time worth it, etc. So with that, I'm going to look at my notes because that's what I do. Um, Yeah. What's stopping you? And that's it for today. So remember to like, subscribe, leave a comment. Tell me about your creative business. I seriously want to know. Leave a review. And don't forget to visit craftleftovers.com for creative inspiration, the whole podcast series, more live streams, etc. Or Kristen M. Roach to see me, or kristenmroach.com to see my portfolio, gallery shop, etc. So when I'm talking about these different things, you kind of have a sense of, you know, what types of products and things I'm talking about. And then of course, littlewoodsherbal.com is my other business. Uh, yeah. Until next time. Bye.